Hello and welcome to the Essential Adventure Sport Podcast, where our aim is to shed some light on the world of adventure sports, be that top tips and best practice for coaches, leaders or guides, inspiring expeditions, or just a chat with one of the many interesting people who work and play in the outdoors. We really welcome interactions and discussions, so if you have an idea of a subject you'd like covering, or you'd like to contribute to the show itself, then please drop us a message. So it's time to sit back and enjoy this week's episode. Well, hello and welcome to episode two of the Essential Adventure Sports Podcast. This week, Nick and I are very excited to be joined by Dr. Lowell Collins, who is the Director of Learning and Development at Plaza Brandon. But many of you may know him from his many years working in the outdoors, or you've got one of his books on a bookshelf at home. Um, today, we're talking about all things decision-making. Uh, but before we start, why don't you give a brief introduction to yourself, Lowell? Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks, thanks for having me. Um little bit about me then really quickly. Uh, I started paddling when I was about eight. Uh, I currently uh, canoe a little bit more than I do kayak because I've managed to damage my back a wee bit. Uh, I got myself a little bit of a reputation for throwing myself off waterfalls when I was in my teens. Uh, I've now grown up and I'm clearly much more, much wiser than that now. So I spend my time predominantly in canoe in northern Canada. Uh, I, I love being up in the Arctic uh, and in that, that big area of tundra, which is fantastic. Or you'll probably bump into me somewhere around Anglesey in a sea kayak, um, which is sort of my, my local stomping ground at the moment. Um, my background is um, as an outdoor instructor. I spent the last 10 years as an academic researching mainly decision making and I'm now back at Plaster Brennan um, uh, looking at the development of the uh, of the learning and the courses uh, and the instructor uh, progressions there that's about me brilliant so as you mentioned there in your introduction you know your 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 recent um, work is all to do with how we make you know, effective decisions within the outdoors, amongst lots of other things. And if you want, um, we can we can put some links in there in in the show notes to some of the work that you've done around different different topic areas. But I guess a good place to start is by just asking you what what do we mean by decision making specifically in relation to adventure sports? I, I guess yeah, that's a it's a good place to start. But I, I'm going to turn your question around the other way really quickly which is we need, we, we need to start a little bit by understanding adventure sports, and then we'll understand why the decision-making is important. So f- for me, adventure sports are uh, activities, are sports that take place in a natural environment and are not particularly constrained or controlled by any external set of rules. Now, the way, the way to think about that is, is that if you, if you think about a 100-metre run, running race, it's done on a track that is clearly defined in a stadium. The environment is completely controlled. There's 12 folks all lined up, and there's a bang, and you run the set distance, and whoever passes the line gets there first. You get drugs tested. You have to wear the right kit. You have to wear the right shoes. Lots of regulation and a manufactured environment. Imagine the opposite of that, a natural environment, and for us, not a great deal of regulation, if any at all, and those are where adventure sports tend to sit. Now, the reason that that's important is that when we're coaching in adventure sports or when we're working in adventure sports, we have to contend with the natural environment which can be really quite dynamic. In fact, you can, you can describe it as hyperdynamic in that there are multiple factors that all interrelate, that are continually changing and continually putting pressures on you as the coach or the leader or the participant. So you're continually going through a process of making decisions. These start before the activity, these occur throughout the activity, and if we want to develop our decision making, happen after the activity as well. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does. I, I once heard you say that um, you use an athletic example. I heard you say, and it's something I talk about now. It's um, um, like a, a rugby pitch or a football pitch, but where the touch lines move in and out, 
and the the try lines move forward and backwards and the the surface is undulating and uh, the ref you know there's no referee that can blow a whistle and just stop playing i think that's um a big a big difference like you say is that um it's a constantly moving and evolving environment that we're working in isn't it rather than just a a very static um place where if something does go wrong or we need to a breather to think about something we can't just take a time out um it, it has to be done as we go along um so yeah no i think that's a really good way of helping to visualize that rugby pitch analogy is a really really good one because it, it it's very very illustrative of of where we are you know li- li- literally if we're sat in a boat or we're on a pair of skis the surface that we're on is continually changing isn't it and frequently as we're going through the activities the goals literally our goals are changing we we paddle down towards Penryn Mower uh, and we might have in our minds that we're going to run through a particular line of Penryn Mower and then when we take a look at it and it's wind over tide or wind cross tide we go I tell you what I'm not going that way I'm going to go this way so I'm continually readjusting my aims my goals uh, for, for the activity so the rugby pitch thing works really really nicely I think. I know a lot in a lot of the work that you've done it has been around decision making, especially a lot of the academic research work. Um, was there a reason why you chose to go down that particular track? Um, yeah, yeah, there was. Um, I, when when I was working on the water uh, and on the hills all the time, there was always something missing in, in what I was doing, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Um, and I, uh, I met a guy called Dave Collins, who was no, no relation. <laughs> um, but he said, have you ever thought that all of this comes down to the judgment and the decision making? As in absolutely everything that you do uh, in an adventure setting directly relates to the quality of the decision that you've made somewhere along the lines. And it got me thinking, uh, and actually it got me thinking enough that that's what I did my PhD in, um, specifically looking at how people make decisions in these complex environments and the factors then that influence the quality of those decisions and what they base those decisions on. So it, it's, it's the glue that holds everything that we do together for me. Okay, that makes sense. Why, so why is it, it might seem like a, a, a simple question to ask, but why is it that us as people who either work or as people who go out just to enjoy the outdoors, why is it important that we can, we can make effective decisions in those environments, do you think? Um, well, it, it, it's the difference between coming home at the end of the day <laughs> and, and, and not, at the, um, if, if you take it to, to extremes. Um, when, when, when you chase back through sort of accidents in the outdoors, uh, you can frequently chase them back to a, a, a set of decisions, of poor decisions at some point. They're very rarely uh, a single catastrophic decision. I mean, that, that does happen. <laughs> Somebody chooses to go left rather than go right. Um, but what you tend to find is, is that you have a series of small decisions that are just slightly off or are based on on poor assumptions or are based on poor inform, uh, poor information or the weighting of that information is is uh, inconsistent so w- what you end up with uh, is uh, the significance of making optimal calls throughout the activity and that it's that bit that makes them so important Um, is that you have to continually be making a good call, not necessarily the perfect call, but you have to make a series of good calls throughout the day in order to get get off the water or or get back from the mountains. That makes sense. No, it does. And you you talked about information there and being able to... I guess one of the one of the skills that, or one of the things that we need to be able to do, and I guess we'll talk about it later, is being able to um, process the information that we're getting because there's lots of information flying around all the time, 
And I guess the difference between being able to make an effective decision and not being able to make one is is the way in which we process that information. Is that right, if I think along those lines? Um, that's certainly a significant part of it. I mean, the, the, the bit to think about here is, is to understand a little bit maybe of how a decision is made. Um, uh, and most decisions that we would make in uh, an adventure sport setting have two very distinct components to them. Uh, they have uh, a, a method of making decisions that is frequently called a classic decision making process. Uh, and what you also have is a, uh, an approach to making decisions that are called naturalistic decisions. Now, the two operate in synergy with each other. And depending on where the decision is made, the proportions of classic type decision making and naturalistic type decision making vary. So if you imagine your classic uh, sort of decision making process, um, th this analogy might work. It, th think, think of Spock in Star Trek. OK, it's all about collecting all the information, good quality information, uh, weighing up the pros and cons in a very logical sort of algorithmic way. And then coming up with an optimal conclusion, you use as much time as it takes. To process as much good quality information as you can possibly have, and that would be a classic decision making process. The naturalistic decision making process is based a lot more on our experience as a decision maker. So it's based very much on what we have experienced in the past and perhaps the decisions that we've made in the past. So naturalistic decision making tends to be a way of simplifying complexity, which is a human tendency, tends to use approaches like recognizing the situation that you are in from a previous experience and recalling the decisions or your actions that you made in that situation uh, and using those as the basis for the decisions that you make. There's a process here that is, that is also referred to as a heuristic, which is developing a set of rules of thumb that you can apply into the situation that you are in and th these are rules of thumb which is essentially a way of simplifying the complexity uh, uh, as well um, and then you have uh, approaches that rely on what are called recognition primed decision approaches so you recognize the situation that you're in and you've made decisions in a particular way in that way in the past so you make those decisions again in a very similar in a similar way. Um, the thing with naturalistic decision making is that it, it allows you to operate under time pressures. It allows you to operate with suboptimal information or, or incomplete information, but it's prone to some biases. And those biases are dependent upon the, re the depth and breadth of your experience. So if you have a very narrow or very shallow experience, those naturalistic decision making processes can be very, very weak. So people make poor calls. Yeah. Now, because the two work together, the naturalistic and the classic, those weaknesses in experience actually affect all decisions that you make because those decisions are a combination of these two factors they have a big impact in the field but they still have an impact in the planning process which is primarily classic but also in the reflection process after the activity which is primarily classic as well so we find decisions in the field are mainly naturalistic we find decisions at either end of the activity are mainly classic and is that is that across all the different domains within adventure sports? You know, the, the same same processes are required whether you work in the mountains or whether you're ski touring or sea kayaking. Yeah, yeah, that's. Um, I, I mean, although my background is in paddling, uh, the 
the studies that, that I've completed uh, have included mountaineers, cavers, skiers, canoeists, kayakers. Um, it's across the full range. And so those, those principles of decision making are very transferable. And we see the same characteristics in all the different activities. When you're when you're planning your days out on the scene, you 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 definitely would go through that classic uh, decision making process as part of the you know the preparation and checking of available information such as tides, weather, those things. But then the majority of your day is spent on the water. So I guess just like you've just said, then Lol, the majority of those decisions that are being made are on the water in the environment, following that naturalistic um, decision making process. Is that is that right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it certainly resonates with my, my first-hand experience. Um, we were discussing earlier uh, in another podcast the process as I go through to collect information uh, around my working days. And, um, for example, the evening before a, uh, a trip with a group of clients, I, I have access to more information uh, through online sources um, crucially I have time available so I can set aside time the evening before to consider uh, by a process of analysis um, to use the, 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 the classic terminology that Lowell just described um, the, the factors that might influence my decisions the next day and I can repeat that the next morning getting up early enough to to give myself time, time to uh, to weigh up uh, the options. Once I'm in the environment itself, um, there are inevitably time pressures, and uh, they're not just they're not just there because of the the passage of time through the day. I've got group expectations, clients that need decisions to be made or need to be part of that decision making process, and as a consequence, it's kind of uh, impractical to to go through every every element that could influence uh, a decision in a moment. As a consequence, I I I use um, I use recognition of of patterns that because I go into a marine environment most working days of my life are, are very familiar to me. So I, we were discussing in a in a previous podcast that the notion of sifting and how I can disregard some stuff that's not pertinent or relevant in the moment and I can focus my attention on the on the, the stuff that matters the differences that make a difference I find that relatively straightforward because of the time I spend in that environment and as you know I, I, I go into the mountains in my free time and as much as I go there quite often I'm far less experienced and I find it a much harder process there the, the, the shortcuts I reach out for are often less reliable. <laughs> I think there, there, there's a couple of really good things in there that uh, I'll, I'll give you some stuff off the press, actually, uh, at the moment, um, is that, that that planning process that Nick, you're talking about there, has some unique characteristics in adventure that we've only just found out. Um, and when you're when you're working, you go through this process, as you've described, of gathering all the information, sifting it, prioritizing it. But there's something unique that then happens. Uh, and that involves creating what's called a straw man plan for the day. And this is the day that I'll, this is the bit of the day that allows you to go, OK, I'm going to go to that coastline. I'm going to think about covering these elements so you create this plan but the whole idea of this plan is that when you actually arrive and you look off the beach or you look off the headland or you look up at the hillside you go that does or does not match the condition forecast that i had that mm. tide has moved is moving more than i thought it would be at this point or mm. that wind is in a different direction and what also happens there is that you then get into the environment with your group and your group will have told you some stuff about themselves you know i yeah. uh, i i'm a really good paddler i can I, I i can paddle in those kind of conditions no problem or um 
yeah i'm very confident when i'm moving around over this kind of terrain but actually when you get into that terrain the first thing you notice as the coach or the leader is that that doesn't quite match the way that that was described to you so the straw man plan is then redesigned and it's redesigned based on you checking and challenging the assumptions that you've made in the original planning process and that's unique and what we what we've discovered from that is that inexperienced adventure sports practitioners and professionals tend to have a, an over adherence to the plan that they originally made and the, the reason they have that is that they frequently invest a lot of time and effort in that plan covering all the bases and so when they get there and it doesn't quite match they're kind of emotionally bonded to that plan so they go with it and it's at that point that's the first one of those little ducks lining up for things to go slightly pear-shaped so understanding how we've made that decision and then being able to recognize that we might be subject to that bias that emotional attachment to that plan is one of the first sort of examples of things starting to go slightly pear-shaped. And there's a there's a desire. Uh, humans have a desire to be consistent, eh? So one decision will will be more likely to lead to another. And having made a plan and arrived at a beach, it's much harder for many groups, I find, to retreat from that that plan uh, than if they hadn't made a plan in the first place. Uh, sometimes we have to physically set it to one side and, and try and find a way to look at the conditions with new eyes and say, well, what is it that we see? What, what, what do we think the challenges of, of this section of coastline are going to offer us today? We'll return to the plan in a moment, but let's metaphorically or literally put it to one side for a moment while we consider what we might encounter out there. I found that some people are very, very committed to their plan and, and, and it, uh, it requires a little bit of careful effort to get them to put it down <laughs> yeah yeah fo folks get really attached to it um uh, and i think your idea of uh, of having a plan that you put aside is, is a good way of dealing with it the other way i've found that has worked really well is not is to make sure that your plan b is actually your plan a if that makes sense so the plan that you've deferred to, because it's all gone slightly, uh, it doesn't look quite as much as, as you anticipated, is the plan that actually is your primary plan. And th is that making sense? Yeah, I like the sound of that. I'd like to explore that a little bit more. So your plan B, that, that I, as you were describing that, I was asking myself, so would, would plan A be the... Um, uh, the dream plan where everything comes together and everything works out perfectly and the ability of the group is perfectly matched to the challenge of the environment and you get to do everything that, that you might do on a day like that. Uh, yeah, and that, that, that's the idea. Your, your, your plan, your, that's your perfect plan. That's where everything is absolutely spot on. You've made all your assumptions are accurate. The group have described themselves well. The time and the conditions are exactly as the forecast said, uh, and it doesn't look as though that's going to change. That's actually your plan B, because you're planning for the perfect world. So your plan A is, is this straw man plan, which is made to be taken apart, made to be redesigned when you've actually checked what you think you know against the reality of what you know. Mm. When when you've been looking into this, Lord, have you um, have you been able to to see any difference depending on people's experience levels, either as a, a personal performer or as a coach or a leader, with with what they do with with that information and the, the decisions they make, or or does everyone tend to get committed to a plan? Is there a difference? Uh, the, the, yeah, there is a difference. Actually, what, what we uh, frequently find is that the experts consider far fewer variables than the less expert people. 
So essentially what's going on is that uh, as an expert, you're selecting and prioritizing the key factors that influence your plan and the decisions that you make from your plan. Um, but less experienced folks tend to be considered considering absolutely everything and perhaps aren't in a situation of being able to prioritize um, effectively the significant bits, the crucial bits that they should be weighting heavily in the process. Is that more based on uh, how they've generated their experience or is that just is it is it the I'm trying to think what I'm saying here is it is it the, the the type of experience they've had so exposure to lots of different situations lots of novel environments or is it just the amount of time they've been doing it for or is that not clear yet um well actually as it happens we're just we're just writing something up on on that at the moment so you're getting this before it goes goes to ink uh, at the moment there are optimal optimal learning experiences that, uh, that that people need to develop the naturalistic decision-making processes and that those experiences unsurprisingly need to be varied and need to be very diverse uh, they need to have an element of re realism about them i.e there needs to be consequences so they can't be fabricated uh, particularly that you know there has to be a real consequence to making the mistake <laughs> uh, at, at that point because that that seems an important dimension um, what we know there is that those experiences should be broad and should be deep that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a lot of them because if you have the right experiences and you learn from them you can develop the judgment and decision-making uh, abilities quite quickly, providing you reflect upon the quality of your decisions in that setting. And that and there's, there's two important bits there. Um, the one is the reflecting upon the, your own decision-making as opposed to just thinking about your day. Uh, so that's crucial. The other bit that's important in there is that it doesn't just necessarily mean uh, that you need more experience. You need more of the right experiences to learn from, and that means reflecting upon those experiences. So uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't just work doubling the number of quality mountain days that you do. It has to be a question of the right mountain days I, yeah, I, I, you just made me, just as you said that, I was just thinking, um, I guess it's something that often happens at the end of, of training courses where people say, go you know, go away and get more experience, but maybe that's not very, um, it's not very explicit as to, as to what the type is or how they're going to go about getting that. It's just, it's, it's understood that if you say to someone, go and get more experience, they're going to know what more experience means. And and I guess from what you're saying there is that maybe we need to think about, um, you know, supporting people with that experience gain in process possibly. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the specifics of what you're talking about there are very much that uh, the the action plan um, that's either designed between training and assessments, uh, for instance. Um, gives consideration to the nature of the experience that's needed. Um, so just saying go climbing more doesn't work. Um, what you might have to say is what you need to do is to do more climbing of this particular grade in this particular environment and pay particular attention to gear placement or route selection. So the action plan has has some very specific focal points and this becomes important because those focal points are what the reflection should focus on for that individual mm. yeah so so action plans frequently need to have a lot more precision in them i would say than just go paddling more or go climbing more.
you know it's it's going paddling with the purpose of and if you if you think about that this is that idea this is an extension of that idea of purposeful practice you know purposeful practice and purposeful reflection on that practice are the ways to develop your decision making skills that which leads me kind of onto that i guess we probably answered it there but um you know how are we how are we going to go away and how are the people who are listening they go great this all sounds amazing and i'm starting to understand it but how do i when i'm out with the club on a saturday afternoon you know how how am i going to go about developing my decision making um good good, good question and uh, historically we've left good quality decision making to develop in a very ad hoc way um so a bit of structure uh, to that process is really really helpful um now that there, there are two elements to this good decision making has these processes that i've just described but it is also very very dependent on having a good understanding of the situation that you are in and this this is this is called situational awareness um but when when we are working with a group or when we are working um with individuals who want a specific outcome from their experience with you we can couch that in terms of what are called situational demands so uh, we've got to develop a good understanding of the situation that we're in and what we've also got to do is to understand the the quality of the options that we have in our bag of tricks now the place to start with both of these and we we've seen used really effectively is to start by encouraging people to be able to provide a, a very good description of the environment that they are in and so so you start uh, both those processes by encouraging a rich and deep description of the situation uh, and when you've when you're getting a good description of the situation that you're in uh, and you you've encouraged people to do that the next step logically if we want to develop situational awareness is to ask that person then to start explaining what they think is causing the situation that they are in what is causing that swell of that frequency of that size what is causing that wave to be shaped in that particular way yeah so you start then to dig into and develop the individual's comprehension of the situation and again that works well with a series of questions um, and then sort of the killer question at the end of all of that is what is going to happen next? So what happens here in 10 minutes? What is going to happen here in an hour? What is going to happen here in six hours? Uh, and that idea of being able to project the situational awareness is, is really, really crucial. So that there's three stages to that part of the process. The other part of that process is to understand the choice factors. So once you've got a good, lovely description, rich description uh, of what's going on, the next little bit is to ask yourself, what are the other ways I could have behaved in this situation? What are the options that I had here? And sometimes individuals don't have any other options, at which point, you need to go and find some other options or individuals have hundreds of options at which point we need to help them refine those options down yeah. once we've got a the options identified the crucial work then is to identify what are the choice factors that led the individual to choose their course their particular course of action and not any of the other courses of action and what you would then do is encourage them to reflect back upon whether that was an effective choice or not or whether the other choices might retrospectively have been slightly better mm -hmm. 
So we've then got the options and the choice factors. And guess what? At the end of that little sequence, it's feasible then to go, OK, what would you do if? So you give them another situation that perhaps they haven't considered and you ask them to reapply what they know in a slightly different way in that situation. So you, you, you can develop the situation awareness, but you can also develop their understanding of the options that they have and the choice factors that they have as well. And then all you do, all you do is bring that together. Is you, you link the choice factors to the situational awareness and the situational demands. It's that easy. <laughs> not <laughs> yeah just with you thinking about um you're saying there about people reflecting back on um the decisions that we've made and then uh, you know deciding whether they what they did was the best possible option or whether it was a you know it was a bad decision that we made um we we're doing um we've got a podcast booked in a few weeks with amy whitehead who i think you know from um your time at uclan and talking to her about um, think aloud stuff, and I think there's probably some things to draw between those two areas that would that would uh, work pretty well. Cool. All right, this is great. Um, so just thinking about some other other things that I know I'm interested in. So and I don't think probably other people at home are probably interested in. Is there a, a definite transferability? So if someone's good at making decisions in a I don't know sea kayaking context, if you then with with some experience that they've got, if you then put them in a, a mountaineering scenario or you put them in a whitewater kayaking scenario, are they able to transfer the decision-making process across those different areas? Or are they hemmed into that particular domain in which they're more expert in? I, I think I understand the question. And it, and it makes me smile. It, it really makes me smile. Because one of the things that you recognise in experts is they frequently transfer their expertise into other domains with perhaps a little bit more confidence than they should have. <laughs> um, and that comes about, I think, because of their situational awareness. So their decision-making processes are probably good, but it falls into the trap of not having appropriate situational awareness. So they, they place, they bring with them a set of biases which compromises the naturalistic part of the decision-making process because they, those, their beliefs, their values, their experience gives them a set of naturalistic decision tools that are misplaced in a different context. That happens more so with, with expert performers or expert coaches whatever we want to talk about that that seems to happen more with them to do with the confidence transfer are we saying okay so there's an element of confidence but there's also an element uh, i'm going to argue in there as well there's an element of um understanding of their own decision making processes um so you have people if you make lots of decisions, lots of tough calls in lots of challenging situations, the heuristics, the rules of thumb that you develop become very refined in that context. The challenge there is that the context is different. So you can be confident, but you're confident in the wrong things. You have a bias in there that leads you to believe that the way you're making that decision is the right way to make that decision when it isn't always the case. So one of the bits that we, we identified uh, quite early on is that although these decision-making processes are uh, sort of mixed with each other, there's an important little audit that goes on that the experts have. And that is quite literally, they'll ask themselves, did I make this decision in the right way? Is it good for me to have made this decision here on a gut call, on a gut feel, or should I have taken more time to weigh 
the pros and the cons more effectively. And one of the characteristics that we find is that experts conduct that audit. They conduct that audit and in some really, really special cases, they actively create space and time to audit their own decision. And this, this is a level of decision making. You're making decisions about your decision making processes that the academics call meta cognition, meta levels of decisions, because you're using the tool back on itself. You're using your you're asking yourself, did I make that decision in the right way? And the, the experts that have good metacognition tend not to fall into the traps that the experts who don't have metacognition fall into because they're auditing their own decision making process. I'm going to put Nick on the spot now. Is <laughs> your, your a, uh, an expert, I know you won't like me saying that, you're an expert with um, when you're out working on the sea with with groups and sea kayaks, and you, the decisions that you make um, are often, always, often very good decisions, um, and that's come through lots of experience, like you talked about before. You've also mentioned that you spend time in the mountains and you like going ski touring, and I'd be interested to hear from you whether how you see the transfer of decisions that you make from your working life where you're out almost every day to your time when you spend in the mountains, which might be seasonal, maybe for a block of time a, a year or maybe block of time every couple of years and how you transfer that, that over. So I'm putting you on the spot a little bit there. Yeah. Right. Thanks Matt. Um, I, I, I've been reflecting on that while Lowell's been uh, sharing this information with us. And um, uh, a couple of quick examples from a working life. Well, yeah, okay. So um, I've uh, not only in sea kayaking, but in other adventure sports, I've been involved with the coastal marine environment a great deal in my working life. And I've got to know the place pretty well. And I'm almost always sea kayaking these days. So in terms of situational awareness on the sea, I, I've had ample opportunity to develop my skills. And um, I am aware that um, pattern recognition is an important aspect of my decision making. I can use relevant heuristic cues to help me uh, shortcut to decisions. And I, and I seem to make reasonable judgment calls. All right. So let's say I'm, I'm getting it right most of the time. Um, <clears throat> I agree entirely from my own um, firsthand experience with what Lowell just said about um, the confidence that, that people can bring to their decision making even if they're not necessarily spending a great deal of time in that environment if they're experienced in another domain because as you know I've been involved with running leader assessments on the sea uh, for a number of years and sometimes those candidates are very active and experienced in another domain like whitewater kayaking or mountaineering and the confidence they bring to their decision making um, is often um, quite evident to me when compared, for example, to an experienced weekend sea kayaker who nevertheless doesn't involve themselves in any other adventure sport. And I sometimes notice the relatively inexperienced um, outdoor, outdoor instructor uh, confidently committing to decisions which, which often work out um, we could discuss that, um, and sometimes they don't work out so well, but they don't tend to get paralyzed by indecision. Um, in my world, as much as I'm experienced in North Wales, you know that once or twice a year I get to go over to North America and I find myself in those long period swells, North Pacific, in places like Oregon and British Columbia, and I'm well aware that there's a potential trap there because I'm required to make decisions with groups uh, that are rooted in my expertise in sea kayaking, but there's a new domain for me. There's a, there's a there's a there's an element that's less familiar to me, and that's the the prevailing underlying swell, which is far more powerful and comes from a different place to that which we experience in this part of the world. And I've got to be careful not to fall into a trap of expert-like decision-making 
where I say to myself, most of what I can see is familiar to me. There's a couple of elements that aren't so familiar. So I'll go with a heuristic solution to this problem that's rooted in stuff I've seen before. First time I went to Oregon, I found myself in those surf zones. I had to say to myself, Nick, this is a new game. There's a lot of expertise and experience you bring to it, but in some important ways, this is a new game. So I better involve some analytical decision making and I better collect up as much information as I can before I commit to a decision, which did include discussing things with some of the local paddlers. Um, if you're happy for me to keep going, I, 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 I know you asked me about um, my mountaineering experience and um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 was, I was that person. I was that person that Lowell just described. Um, you know, it's about 10, 15 years ago, I got into um, skiing steeper slopes in the Chamonix Valley and I was very driven to do that because it was a, a, a dream of mine to, to get involved in that, in that um, in that skiing environment and my experience of decision making in the outdoors helped me commit to those plans it actually got me to the top of a number of routes that I wanted to ski I was able to use a process of analysis the day before and that morning to help me make some judgments about where I was going to go it enabled me to understand the the more heuristic decision making that would take place when I found myself in steep slopes that I was kind of familiar with from a technical point of view, but were in a new, more demanding environment. But it also led me into trouble because my situational awareness wasn't as advanced as it needs to be. I, I found myself at that stage of my development in places where the environment was more complex than I was used to. And there was one occasion when I was able to reflect on that, having, um, having made assumptions about the environment of skiing through. And then I found myself falling through a Bergschrund and lying alone on a snow bridge, wondering how on earth I'd ever got myself into that situation. And I think that was a misplaced level of confidence that was rooted in other adventure sport experiences that gave me decision-making powers. It was rooted in a confidence in my technical ability, but the crucial missing ingredient for me was a depth of situational awareness that would have kept me from exposure to the hazard that almost caused me a great deal of trouble that day. Does that, does all that make sense? That, that, that makes good sense. Um, and it, and it, it's, it's a situation that I think we've all found ourselves in for, from time to time, you know, asking, how, how, how the hell did I find myself here? <laughs> yeah. I, sh I shouldn't have been here. Um, and it, for me, it comes back to the, the situational awareness. And when, when I'm working with a group, it, it comes back to what the group wants from being in that situation as well. So I, I have to understand the, the situational demands of the, uh, of the group that I'm with in the situation that I'm in, the situational awareness, and and then select from this range of options effectively to meet their demands. Uh, I, I mean, the, the, the fun thing for me is that when, when we look at a typical working adventure sports professional, the complexity of what they do is very, very high. And it, it's very high and it's very, very demanding. Um, so it, it has a great drain on sort of the, the decision-making resource that you have. So if, if, if you have a, a bucket of decision-making tool, the tools out of the bucket, and you run out of the cognitive uh, resource to make good decisions. And it, it, it's actually got a name. It's called decision-making fatigue. And the closer you get to the bottom of that pile, the worse your decisions get. So we find that uh, people make progressively poorer and poorer decisions as they've used up more and more and more of their resource. So uh, that's something to watch out for because you, you have to have ways of managing that cognitive resource so that you can make good calls throughout the day that can be really challenging 
and I imagine that things like um, stress due to you know an incident occurring or something like that is going to further deplete those you know that that amount of space that you've got and that amount of time that you've got to make those decisions. Is that right? Um, it, it does, but what helps you there is to think of the, those resources are used in acute or chronic ways. So there are chronic demands on your decision making processes throughout the day or over the duration of the trip. And, and you have to actively take opportunities to recharge your your decision making resource. So that it's that point in the evening where you're sitting around the fire and actually you have just distanced yourself from the group enough that you're not getting all those questions uh, about the day and you're actively not planning the next day. You are deliberately creating space to recharge your, your decision making batteries. The flip side of that are these acute pressures. And we, we just published uh, recently on, on this we're not quite sure what goes on here at the moment because it's either an overdraft facility that you can use and in the in the height of an emergency situation you can go you can use up that resource and go beyond it so it's an overdraft or people deliberately re ring fence part of that resource so an experienced person, someone with a, a, a high metacognitive ability can sit there and say, I tell you what, I need to keep this little bit in reserve because if it goes pear shaped, I'm going to need to make a whole load of difficult calls. We haven't quite got to the bottom of that yet. So is this an overdraft? And ultimately you use up the overdraft, which might be why you can deal with an emergency for an hour, two hours, three hours? Or have I actively safeguarded part of my decision-making capacity to cope with the pressures of a potential emergency? Or is it a combination of both? It might be a combination of both. So we're, we're looking into that at the moment because that, that in, interests me a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the cognitive demands, the cognitive loads that people are under. And uh, the, um, you talked before about um, experts being able to, to to sift through the information a lot better and select what's going on, whereas the people who are, um, I think you call them less experts, are, there's more information in front of them, so they're, they're taking on board more. Does does that have, a, I guess that has an impact with how they, um, with that cognitive load, if they're having to, if they're having more things that they're having to process, then it's, it's eating into that um um, I can't think what you call it, the bucket. It's eaten into the bucket yeah. more than it is yeah. for the, the experts. Um, and, and I think I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Matt. Um, what we find is that less experienced decision makers use up a lot more of the cognitive resource yeah, um, frequently because they are considering too many possibilities. And what the experts do is they, they know the bits that they can ignore that are not relevant, uh, and so they they deprioritize them. And uh, um, one, one of my guys uh, described this as being able to identify the crocodile that is closest to the boat. Mm -hmm. And it's it's a lovely analogy because it's all about recognizing the crucial bit, the crocodile you are going to respond to, rather than the crocodile that is off there in the distance and rather uh, and, and less significant. The, um, the, the bit you're describing is, is another well-documented psychological uh, element. And you, you have what is called the decision-making paradox. And that is that when you consider too many options, you become paralyzed because you have too many options to consider. And so we find less experienced folks become cognitively tired quite quickly compared to the experts, which was, which is why experts look like they're making good calls effortless, effortlessly. Okay, but what you also get is that they are, it's because they are considering too many possibilities. 
So it, there is this crucial element of filtering out the bits that are irrelevant, which is what the experts are good at. Yeah, um, I find myself thinking about a um, first-hand experience I often have when I'm out on the west coast of Anglesey with clients, and um, frequently I'm in the vicinity of Pemry Mar, and we're we're looking at some decision-making challenges, and it, it's often that I invite my clients to uh, select from a number of route options through a, a tide race area like Penry Mar. And of course, we know that there's more than one way to get the job done. Um, and I find that it often only requires more than two choices for people to start to get overwhelmed with options. Um, they become aware that we could follow an inshore route close to the headland, we could take the obvious gap between the two big rocky islands, or we could go around the outside of everything. And it's often necessary for us to rule out one of those options quite early in the decision-making process in order for, um, for people to feel able to then commit to a decision. Um, by way of example, I often get people pointing out to me that there's this occasional and substantial breaking waves on what appears to be the outside of the outer rock. And we, we consult the chart and we see that there's some shallow water out there. In fact, there's a couple of isolated rocks and the waves are periodically breaking heavily in that area. Um, and that continues to be a, a focus for, for some people in the group. So in order to simplify the, the situation, I encourage them to, to consider, to project forwards and say, well, what, what would that look like if we went over there? and all kinds of negative words get used about what's likely to happen if we paddle through that zone. So, all right, let's rule it out. Let's, let's simply discount that as an option. Let's, let's turn away from the outer route choice, and now we'll consider the inner and the middle option. And, and at that point, I notice that many of my students are better able to then process the remaining information and say, okay, well, what would be the pros and cons of route A or route B. But until we've narrowed down some of the the, the, the variables in, in terms of the decision they're about to make, it, it's quite hard to get to the point where we, we commit to a plan. Um, I don't know if I'm on the, the same page here with what we've been talking about, but that was where my thoughts took me. Right, but I, I, I think we are on the same page because what, what you're describing is another way that we can use to develop effective decision making. And it, it, it's a process called a, a, a cognitive apprenticeship. So if, if we serve an apprenticeship in a sea kayak, it tends to be lots about paddles and edges uh, and boats. But we can serve a cognitive apprenticeship as well as a, a, a practical apprenticeship. And the, the way you would use a cognitive apprenticeship ap uh, approach would be for you to articulate the decisions and the factors uh, and the choices that you're making explicitly with the people that you're working with mm -hmm. so that they can see the thought processes that are going on in your mind and the bits that you're, you are particularly paying attention to. And what then happens in the developmental process is the balance is actively shifted and we start to encourage people to describe their environment and we start them to get to pay attention to what, they're, uh, what they are basing their decisions upon um, so that by the end of their apprenticeship with you, those folks are art articulating to you their decision making processes. But it's been a very gradual process and, and part way through, you know, you're working together to identify key points and recognising the significance of particular factors. So you're handing the cognitive responsibility over as you go through that developmental process. Works really, really nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, can take anything from an hour through to years. Um, but that, that, that's what I think you're describing there, Nick. Okay. Great, that's food for thought. I'll, I'll continue to explore that when I'm allowed on the water again. Um, yeah. We've got some questions in, in, in a short while from some of our um, essential members, and one of the things that um, that Greg highlighted as, as part of his question was that um, sometimes when he's out and he's being led 
being looked after that he'd like to be able to he, he describes it as peer inside my coach or my leader's head to see what's going through the mind and i guess that links with this cognitive apprenticeship is that you're you're sharing your thoughts about what's going on so you're not just making decisions and they're just following you they're, they're a part of the process and they're eventually going to develop those um those ways of doing it for themselves and it, it, i think um the the approach works really well but it, it does rely completely on the decision maker understanding why they're making decisions and uh, it, it, it is possible to make a whole series of really good calls just by luck <laughs> and, and to get away with it. Um, and so it, it, it can be a problematic approach if you don't understand how you make your own decisions and the choice factors that you rely upon. Now, that the element there that's really important is that it means the coach or the leader has to delve back into what they understand rather than just relying on it being intuitive and intuitive is the phase that everybody used to use in the recent when we were interviewing people in in the oh well that that was intuition we found one example of intuition one example with a very, very, very well-known sea kayak. Um, everything else we found intuition was given as a reason to not to have to explain the complexity of the decision that was being made. Mm -hmm. So we always had to dig into uh, whenever anybody said, oh, well, that's intuition. And whenever we dug into it, it became really apparent that it wasn't intuitive it was easy access to the naturalistic decision-making processes. And the more you use these decision-making processes, the easier they become to access. And you end up perhaps not having to think about these things explicitly. And so they get couched in this, it's intuition phase. So watch out for intuition, because it's quite a rare thing. It does exist, but it's a really rare thing. You can delve into the coach or the leader's thought processes, ask them what options they considered, ask them what choice factors they're based, they're basing their decisions on, ask them what's causing that situation. So turn on them the tools that we highlighted earlier on. And you'll 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 find out what's going on that way. Quiz them. No such thing as a daft question. Always good questions. Yeah, I think that I think that resonates with my experience in that period of my career when I went from being in a, not only an instructor and guide to running to running leader and coach training courses. And it was as I found myself in that world of coach and leader education that I was much more frequently being asked to verbalize and express my decision making processes. And I can remember at that time I thought to myself. I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what it is that I do. Um, and I did wonder back then, is it just gut feeling that, that gets me through the day? Uh, and of course, it became apparent that it wasn't, that my decision making was rooted in, in uh, judgments that I could express. But I think my ability to, to identify where they came from and to describe them, to verbalize them to people, what wasn't as developed as it is today. I think I just began to understand the process a bit better and it, I realized that it wasn't just a series of gut feeling decisions that, that, that got me through my, through my guiding and my instructing days. Um, Matt Greger asked the question like what, what could he do to help develop this understanding a bit and in addition to everything that's been suggested so far, one, one one suggestion I'd make to Greg is if he's afloat with someone who's got a leadership responsibility, before they get on the water, it might be useful for Greg to agree with uh, the leader some decision points en route where they could check in with each other and say, hey, before we go around this headland, that could be a good moment for me to chat with you and find out 
where your thought processes are taking you and how you're how you're making decisions for the next section of the journey. There's always moments in the course of the day when that could happen, and it could be helpful to Greg if he if he agrees them in advance. Uh, the mouth of a bay or an inlet or a lunch beach and so on. Places where the leader might feel they've got a bit more cognitive process in space to chat with Greg about that. I think if they have that that conversation beforehand, it doesn't put them on the spot when you know they're at a decision point and in you know in his ear saying what what's going on now what what are you thinking yeah uh, it gives him time to process what he's going to then discuss with Greg when he gets to those decision points so yeah I think that's a good bit good bit of advice for him um I've got I've got one more question before we go on to some questions from audience questions and um again this this might be one that we can't um, quantify but are there are there specific characteristics that people display if if they're good at making decisions so they they make effective decisions is, is there any evidence for that at all we we do find that people who make uh good call consistently good calls are thinking about their professional practice and that's professional practice with a small p yeah because anybody working with responsibility for a group or on the sea. So we, we find that it, um, if, if folks think about what they do, are critical of what they do uh, and are reflective, uh, those folks develop much more robust uh, decision-making processes. The challenge there is that you probably learn most by making bad calls and for us, where we play, that can be quite dearly paid for. So you have to be really, really careful here. Uh, and and that, that is recognizing uh, that it's worth thinking through and being critical, self-critical of what you do, but perhaps also realizing that uh, sometimes things do just go a little bit pear-shaped. Um, and that it doesn't necessarily have to be a failing on your part. This is part of that hyperdynamic environment thing, is that we, we work in environments that are really very, very, very complex. It, it seems like those people who are good are, are active and they, they don't just say, oh, well, if I go out and do things, I will become better there once they get off the water or they get off the you know down from the hill or whatever it might be is that they're 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 doing something in between the last and their next time out doing things so yeah that really does answer the question Uh, and i i see what you mean about the um you said about professional practice and you you know it's not just about whether you got and earn money is it it's whether you take that approach to something um, well, and that, that's the crucial bit is that one of the elements of being a professional is always wanting to do a better job, which almost by definition means that we have to be reflective and we have to be critical of what we've done. You know, uh, we, we have to say to ourselves, was, was that a day, was, was that uh, a, as good a day as it could have been? And the, the way I used to do it with myself uh, when I was working on the water a lot, was to ask myself, is it, would I have passed my level five assessment doing this this way? So I, I found myself continually when I was working, behaving as if I had somebody on my shoulder going, why are you doing that? Are you doing that that way? So I had this, li- this little lol coach on my shoulder whispering in my ear, could you do this better? Could this be, could, is this the best way of doing this? Could you change this to make it better? Mm. So I have this little voice in my in, in my right ear, uh, on the, you know, just, just continually checking and challenging what, I, what I'm doing and why am I doing it? Why am I doing that? Should I do it a different way? Why aren't I doing it a different way? Right, I'm going to do it a different way, <laughs> sort of thing. Is that is that something you still, you know, do you still have the little lol coach on your shoulder you know you're still trying to actively develop that way um yes but but now he probably has a tweed jacket on and leather elbow pads 
uh, and, and so he, he, he's kind of whispering in my ear going um you know oh that would be good to know about so I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example of it we, 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 we're doing a little piece of we just finished doing a piece of work on lead climbing teaching uh, and I, I got inspired to look into lead climbing teaching um not because I do a lot of it, but because I went to a session run by a very experienced guide, a guy called Tim Neal. And he, he was teaching all the rope trickery that, that goes with teaching lead climbing. And I was dead excited. You know, it's anodized. It's exciting. And then I realized, and this, the little chimp on my shoulder said, oh, wouldn't it be interesting to know how these people make decisions about when to let that person go to the sharp end of the rope? And it just gave me a whole study to play with. And we, we, we're doing a webinar for MT, uh, for mountain training on that, um, towards the end of the month, uh, which will be interesting. Uh, I'm hoping to get lots of tricky questions from the, from the people there. <laughs> you heard it here first. Give him, give him a hard time. Give him a hard time. Um, <laughs> all right, great. Well, we've just got uh, a few little questions that have been sent in, say, from our, um, our essential members. And some of them have already been answered because um, we've talked about an awful lot of stuff. So um, I think I can skip through some of those things. But we've had a question from from James, and um, it's in relation to his, his confidence level. So he says, um, my lack of confidence, and this is in relation to, to, to sea kayaking, I think, um, my lack of confidence comes from knowing I'm not able to judge and read the environment uh, suitably. He calls it unknown unknowns. Um, he's gone full run, Rumsfeld on that one. Um, so what can he do to develop this? What can he do to develop this this uncertainty he has about how to judge and read the environment? And, and either either one of you can jump in on this. Um, for, for me there, Matt, I would go, I'd be spending a lot of time on situational awareness. Yeah, um, because it f frequently... Um, folks have a negative experience in an environment because they uh, don't understand it uh, particularly or people make poor calls because they don't understand the environment so I, i'd start by getting out um uh, and paying particular attention to the environment that, that, that i was in because once once i understand the environment my confidence grows from that position and then what I would do is, is I would be critical, but not harsh on the decisions that I make and keep that, keep that flexibility. Yeah. But don't be afraid to ask yourself, well, was that the right call there? Because when it turns out that it was, that's reinforcing, that's building your confidence, isn't it? Mm. And if it turns out that it wasn't, you can then learn from it. And that's building your confidence as well. So there's always a positive outcome <laughs> that can be sought from a, from any experience. Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess if we're, you know, for, for those who, if you're listening, who you are already members, then we've done um, we've done a couple of little videos on situation awareness. So if you're thinking, oh, I'd like to know a bit more about that on the on the platform itself, there's a we did a webinar about an hour and hour and thirty minutes where we talked all about situational awareness. So go and take a look at that and it might help give you a bit more background on on these things that we're talking about um great Any, anything from you nick on that question uh yeah sure uh, it's from great james from, from james from james yeah and james talking about confidence um uh yeah just um from personal experience um a couple of years ago as you know i i found myself spending a bit more time in California and I was part of that surf kayaking community and I found myself going off on surf trips with them to places that looked a little different to the surf beaches I was used to in North Wales. Let's just say they're a bit heavier. And I noticed, the first thing I noticed was, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a collapse, but a slight undermining of confidence <laughs> that I felt upon arriving at some of these venues. And it was, a, it was an uncomfortable feeling for me because you know, I'm a pretty confident tide race paddler and I can get down whitewater rivers. Um, and I've got a reasonable degree of experience in rough water. But nevertheless, I found myself looking at some of these surf venues saying, I don't feel really great about this. 
and I reminded myself, come on, you're a coach, Nick, you can coach yourself. So I reminded myself that confidence comes from positive first-hand experience. That, that's going to be my most significant influencer. I could get some confidence from vicarious experience and the encouragement that others can give me, um, some of which I received from some group members. Um, so what I did was occasionally, if I was really feeling it, I'd sit on the beach for a while because I would remind myself that an understanding and awareness of the venue I was going to go to um, would help me greatly in that moment. So while others were getting on the water quite quickly, I would sit there and I would watch the waves, I'd watch them paddle out, I would start to collect as much information as I could and I'd be mindful that there would be a real advantage to that up to a point. And I would say to myself, I'm not going to put a clock on it, but there'll come a point when I say I've done enough of that, it's time to get on the water, or I'll conclude that I'm going to go and do something else. Yeah. And pretty much every time I got on the water. Um, I then did some things that I was very familiar with. <laughs> I, I paddled out and spent a bit of time in the soup. It's a very familiar environment. And I, uh, I just reminded myself that I could get some appreciation of the power of the waves, get a feel for what they were doing to me. And then gradually I'd make my, set, make my way out beyond the brake line and I'd be catching waves with everybody else. So I took a progressive approach to it that was rooted in trying to get as many positive experiences as I could while building my awareness of the environment. Um, if James is a sea kayaker and he's trying to build situational awareness, I would encourage him to you know, be, be aware of a number of things when you're out there, but also pick some themes. So uh, you could spend some time in the day paying attention to changes in wind strength and direction. Uh, just, just check in every now and then. Has the wind strength changed at all? Has the direction changed? One I get my clients to do a lot is to look at the patterns of the waves as they as they make contact with a rocky shoreline. And we've got a lot of that on Anglesey. So um, I will ask them to describe to me what they've observed about the previous few minutes of paddling and what they noticed about the wave patterns, their height, the way they were breaking against the rocks. And I've noticed that drawing their attention to a specific element will help them build that awareness. And as a secondary development, they'll gain more confidence about their proximity to the rocks. So James could play around with that a little bit as well. Great, like it. Um, Nick, Greg's asked a couple of questions, but I think we've I think we've pretty much answered them. You know, how do I get better at making decisions? We've definitely talked about that quite a lot. Um, he does ask a, a secondary question, um, which he calls a weird one. But like you said, Lol, there's no such thing as a as a bad or in this case a weird question. But he wants to know how. How does he know when a good decision has been made? Or, in fact, yes, yes, he says, how do I know when a decision has been made? Um, and by that, he means how can he be more aware of um, when he's out being led or being coached? How can he be more aware of, of when that coach or leader is, is making a decision? And I guess we've talked about that as well, haven't we, about having those conversations and maybe um, talking beforehand about those things? Um, yeah, I, I think... I think, in particular, uh, in sea kayaking, where in in all coaching, actually, it's it is continually a decision making process, um, and so the 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 trite answer is decisions are happening all the time. Um, the crucial bit, I think, is to get the person to articulate their their decisions to you. Um, because we, we do make decisions that we don't pay particular attention to because they're easy. I, I didn't choose what socks to put on this morning because they happen to be the ones that were close at hand. Um, but it is actually still a decision because I have at least three pairs of socks hmm. that, I, that I get to choose from. Um, so uh, talk, talk with the coach and the leader get them to articulate what they're doing uh, that's the way of doing it um, the other giveaway uh, is sometimes the decision maker will move themselves away from the group so that they create space and time to process the complex decision and that, that's a characteristic that we see of, of the experts as well is that they build into their practice 
a way of stepping away from the group so they can specifically pay attention to the, to the complex decision they're about to have to make. Yeah, yeah. I, it's something we talk about on when we do coach ed courses about creating time for yourself. So setting tasks to to give yourself time to to, to think about what's going on. Um, so you, yeah. you, you you don't have to be front and center doing all the work. Um, so yeah, sitting away and taking time to think about something is definitely a good indicator. Um, yeah. Brilliant. All right, final final question because I know we're gonna we're just we're just about to run out of time. But um, Rose got this question specifically for you, Lolly. He wants to know. And you might not be able to do this verbally. It might need, you know, something else. But he wants to know um, how to decide how to to properly thread his safety harness release buckle. Um, and 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 I know you've done some some work on this, and you you know you've done some professional work with I think it's with Palm maybe. Um, so it might be that we can just direct him somewhere. But there you go. There's a question yeah. to finish. This off. <laughs> so so. Uh, uh, what- that's a really good question, actually, because that's that's the other area of research that I'm that I'm, I've played around in is is in whitewater rescue. Um, it's actually really straightforward. Um, thread your buckle, um, including the back bar, so that uh, there's enough tape poking through the buckle that when you release it by pulling the toggle away from you everything separates and that's the way in which you uh, assure yourself of a complete release with that buckle so what you would do is you would then either trim the tape or adjust the harness so that when you pull that buckle away from from you using the toggle the tape and the buckle and the back bar all separate and then you've got the length right brilliant there you go. Nice and simple. And I know, I think I've seen a video somewhere. It could be, it could be on something like the, the Palm website where they've done a video, a video demonstration. So, you know what, I'll try and find that and I'll put a link in, um, in the show notes so you can take a look at that as well. Um, that, that's it. We are definitely out of time. We, in fact, we are two minutes before, before our deadline. So I just want to say a, a, a massive thanks Lol, for joining Nick and I today. I think it's been really interesting and it's probably, um, going to leave people with more questions so um maybe at some point in the future it'd be great for you to come back and do a do a second episode and we can touch on some of the things that come up as a result of today's chat if that's okay uh, i'd love to i've really enjoyed it it's, it's always good talking to people who are actively doing it because i've got some more ideas for more things to go and look at my, my little academic on my right shoulder is going what about this oh go and have a look at that so yeah i'll, I'll more than happy to come back Thank you for joining us, Lol. Really appreciate it. Lovely. (laughs) Great. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you again soon. If you've enjoyed the show, why not take a look at our Essential Members program? For only £3.60 a month, you get exclusive access to a huge range of videos, articles and webinars covering technical skills, leadership principles and coaching issues from the world of paddle sports with many topics easily transferred to other adventure sports we think it's amazing value so come and check it out remember don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode until next time have fun and stay safe